Welcome to Blockchain Recorded, the podcast for the tech curious, where we talk about anything and everything related to the exponentially evolving crypto, blockchain, and Web 3.0 space. Our mission is simple, to share knowledge, facilitate discourse, and help evolve education in blockchain fundamentals, decentralization solutions, and relevant use cases for today's digital economy. We at Blockchain Recorded are not registered investment advisors and do not deal with financial or trading token elements, nor offer any licensed financial services. The content of this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only, while the opinions of all parties involved are their own. I'm your host, Nina Tserar, and now let's talk blockchain. So before I introduce our guest today, I have a couple of brief updates for our community. We invite everyone to join us on Twitter Spaces, where we pre-stream each episode the day before it goes public on all major podcast platforms. For the platform list, visit our website, blockchainrecorded.com. We also have an NFT program with Blockchain Recorded Community NFTs. These can be claimed from our homepage. So check us out, visit our website, and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube for updates and potential airdrops. This episode is dedicated to the Web3 Stronger Together ecosystem initiative and its first virtual summit, which took place between March 1st and March 4th, 2023 in Evelyn's Metaverse, a virtual platform uniting several hundred Web3 leaders and thinkers, over 100 projects and speakers, and over 5,000 attendees from across the world. The purpose of Web3 Stronger Together, with which Blockchain Recorded is a proud media partner, is to demonstrate to the crypto community that the Web3 ecosystem is strong, solidary, active, and committed to furthering innovation, despite the status of the market and nature of price speculations. It emphasizes the importance of fairness, inclusivity, diversity, and sustainability to furthering healthy Web3 fundamentals. The summit included many panel discussions with assigned topics, which Blockchain Recorded is redistributing in audio form. The fourth panel discussion on March 1st covered the topic of the future of work with respect to the metaverse and Gamify. The speakers were Greg Chu, the CEO of QPQ, Miriam Bryan, founder and CEO of Hollow Art Collective, Lynn Gitao, founder of Metaversations, and Ricky Hauk, otherwise known as MetaRick, a metaverse evangelist. The panel reflects on how remote collaboration through the metaverse can provide diversity, global connection, commute time savings, etc. But how do we give an equal chance to everyone everywhere globally? The speakers discuss the opportunities and challenges for the digital landscape and further present the need for a mindset shift with focus points for the future and changing nature of human interaction. The following is the panel's discussion hosted by Laurent Perello, the leader behind the Web3 Stronger Together ecosystem initiative. We do apologize for the potential audio drops due to choppy internet connections. We edited the recording to the best of our ability. It's a fourth uh, panel discussion. We will talk about the future of work, how GameFi and the Metaverse can uh, transform remote collaboration. But first, I want to welcome uh, Greg, Lynn, Ricky, and uh, Miriam, who should join soon. Thanks for being there. I'm really honored and pleased to host you. It's uh, it's something really important for us to be able to uh, deliver a different point of view, vision, expertise this the last uh, next three days. So let's start with uh, Greg. Could you quickly introduce yourself and uh, tell us why and what are you doing in, uh, in, in Web3? So, uh, hi, my name is Greg Chu. I'm the CEO on QPQ. We're building infrastructures to make Web3 really possible. It's to you, Greg Lin. Hi, my name is Lin Getal. I'm from the Urbi Kenya. And uh, thank you for having me. Today, this panel is very diverse. I love uh, working in a diverse area. Speaking of the future of work. So, I'm the founder of Metaversations. And uh, what we do is educate and evangelize and create opportunities for the African continent. And regards to Web3, as well as the metaverse, if you've noticed for the couple of decades in century, Africa has always been left behind. But I think uh, for us, Web3 is another opportunity for us to be at par with the world because Web3 has really kept us at par. We are all at par. We are all looking into the future. We are all now building. So Web3 is very key to us, very paramount, and we see it as an opportunity to be partakers of the future. So that is why Vitalization is here. I don't want Africa to be left behind. And that is generally me. I'm a PR in communications as well. Uh, I do PR in communications. 
So I use my communications and PR skills to communicate tech to the African continent. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Vicky, and welcome, uh, Miriam. I, I give you the mic in, in a second. Vicky, can you quickly introduce yourself? Hey, great to be here. I'm based in San Diego, California, so it's 3.30 a.m. over here. Excited to be sipping my coffee and chatting with all of y'all about the future of work and uh, joining the AI panel in a couple of days. So my background uh, is really focused more on the business side of Metaverse. So talking with enterprise brands around corporate use cases for how they can sell things in the Metaverse, how they can host events, internal collaboration and training, um, any sort of kind of human to human communications in the business world, which means my focus tends to lean a little bit more on the experiential side. Um, so dealing with 3D virtual world building, uh, the infrastructure around hosting those virtual worlds. But I also dabble quite a bit in digital ownership, um, advising for a handful of startups and have spent plenty of my hours on Discord channels and Twitter spaces trying to understand uh, kind of the front lines of why do people buy into a community? How do they interact with the community? What makes one successful versus what makes one a failure? And kind of sussing out the, the difference between what's real and what's not. Uh, but I do think it's early for all of us. Um, anyone isn't necessarily a full on expert, but we're all curious. We're all excited. Uh, we're all part of the conversation. And I think that's what I'm most excited about today is just to continue being an active participant in that conversation. Thanks to you. Aaron. I used to say that I know nothing. I'm still learning. Miriam, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, it's six thirty here in Canada, and I had logged in a few minutes before. Uh, so this is just an indication of Web three still being dependent on this internet connection that I think is really fascinating. And so from uh, what I gather is that we have an incredible panel here today. I'm delighted to join you. Um, my work in Web three. I'm part of the Metaverse Innovation Lab, looking at business use cases for private, public, and para public sector. I also am leading a global art collective that is focused on building digital literacy uh, internationally because uh, I, I do uh, believe that we're at the cusp of a potential shift in the way that future generations will be able to engage with each other and with technology. And so to help bridge that digital literacy gap in the artistic world and explore the future of co-creation and cultural co-authorship, I am working on uh, Hollow Art. Um, that's Hollow hyphen art.io and uh, my passion and my background is really looking at the human side of change at scale. So how do we get people to change um, internationally, uh, nationally, locally uh, when it comes to technology and how to work together? So thank you, Laurent, and uh, looking forward to the panel. Th thanks to you guys uh, for this introduction. So let's uh, dive in the topic. We have to talk about the future of work. I, I told you uh, previously that I'm a digital woman uh, now since uh, 17 years, if I'm correct. I have been a cloud computing uh, pioneer, was able to, to do a webinar in, in, uh, in Wazazat, in the desert, uh, in the mountain, everywhere. And I agree, uh, Mariam, we are still uh, dependent on the on the flow and in some region uh, it's it's a real uh, issue still how do you see uh, gaming uh, game fire and metaverse uh, transforming remote uh, working who want to start I, i can start on this because uh, although i'm not a, a subject matter expert when it comes to things i have actually had to deal with some of this have at this because in 2021 we had a very distributed team we had some people had people in Ireland and people in California. That time differential was, was one big factor. But another was, how do we preserve the culture we want to try and foster across such a, a split up group? You know, we had offices, we had people who were working from home, and we were really actively looking at exactly this as an issue. Could we use the art always and actually work with each other? Because we found that when we came together, We were so much more able to communicate ideas, flow, discussion, etc. Getting out a whiteboard and even just taking the pen, it, it's so much easier to, to, to feed into that together than it is on even on, on something. There's some really good apps out there to do this on. It's just that it doesn't quite fit and say it doesn't have that same organic floods. How do we 
make uh, arm come together that actually allows us to be ourselves, to represent to one another in a way that allows us to feed energy. People talk about the difference between extroverts and introverts. That an introvert is somebody who draws this powerful self, extroverts draw from other people. How do we feed that kind of energy? You know, it's really tough to do using something like a mirror. Whilst, yes, it's a great tool, does it allow us to, to have that human communication? I'm not sure. I think that's fundamental to, to us me. It's clearly work. It's finding that way of creating that commitment. On to, to interact. Mariam, I see you. Oh, uh, sure. I agree with uh, with uh, Greg, and I think it's uh, it's exposed some challenges and opportunities. And I think on the side of opportunities, we have greater connectivity. I'm currently uh, working um, as a digital consultant with a global boutique uh, firm with 400 um Uh, employees spread out across you know four or five different continents and it's the same dilemma of how do you grow and scale and maintain an innovative work culture uh, and this is across time zones this is across uh, cultures and across generations and the the piece around tech is really important and I think the gamefi uh, introduction, is somewhere where we're headed, I think, um, uh, not just uh, in the future of work, but even with children and education, I think this gamification, tapping into those motivators that allow people to move from one level to the other is changing who we are as humans. And I think it merits conversations like this. So I'd like to keep some space open for the other panelists and happy to jump back in after. Lynn, can you share your, your experience based in your uh, In Africa, I, I, I heard that you, you collaborate with projects all around the world. Can you uh, give some advice, uh, share your experience and tell us how the metaverse can improve the way we, we work uh, remotely? Yes, yeah, so uh, as an African, we really love diversity. We are diverse and we want to get out of the world. So there's so many exams when it comes to getting visas getting jobs and we want to expand to the world and for us the best way that has come to see was I'd say Web3 because in the past two years Web3 has really created a lot of employment here in Africa and not because people work in physical offices but because they work virtually. Since 2020 we saw a very huge transformation it was like a reset and uh, here in Africa We came to the dawn whereby majority of us spend four hours in traffic in a day. You can imagine four hours. So in a week, that is a whole day gone in traffic. And uh, when it comes to working, uh, the, the, the global or the majority of us are young people. Young people don't want to go to offices. I'm a young person. I don't want to go to the office and meet my boss, meet the same same people. I want to work somewhere there's diversity, where I can travel, where I can still enjoy by fun, you know? And for me, Metaverse, well, when I think about the Metaverse and how it has been recepted here in my country and here in my continent with the young people, they're, they're ready to take up the job. Actually, the, the only exam is the internet for some countries, and uh, that still really remains the biggest problem. problem when it comes to accessing the metaverse. But for us, we're really open to get out of the world, not only using flights and all that, because the visas are very hard to get visas here, but to get out of the world using remote, me interacting with people from Europe, just in the metaverse. We have a lot of spaces in Spatial, we have spaces in the Decentraland, I mean, getting there and meeting someone from USA, sharing our perspectives. For us, that is a game changer, and we are definitely open to this chemify and everything that has to do with remote work, metaverse and web 3. Thanks to you. Uh, Ricky, what is your point of view? I have, I have so many thoughts, so many thoughts on this. And, uh, so the, the first one I want to focus on is, is this idea of culture. I've heard, I've heard all three of the other speakers talk about it. And let's look back before remote work, right? Like, like companies were spending millions and millions of dollars trying to maintain morale and the sense of culture and we all knew that most of the things they were spending that money on wasn't working like avocado toast and pizza parties and 
like a little extra happy hour budget or whatever, right? Like, like it was all going towards these kind of very surface level things to try and get people content with work or the, these kind of workshops that, that weren't the most productive. The pandemic highlighted how much all that stuff didn't work and people really valued the ability not to have to sit in traffic and the ability to have more flexibility in their, in their time. And I think something that's interesting about metaverse, at least, at least VR, um, I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I'm the VR guy in San Diego. Like I've got two headsets. Everyone has never tried VR before that comes by my apartment. They get to try VR for the first time. So I've seen a lot of people kind of put a headset on for the first time, experience this. And it's always the same thing. They get this childlike smile. They get this little authentic giggle. They probably haven't had since they were six years old and saw a puppy for the first time. And that happened instantly just by putting this headset on and looking at a virtual zebra in some weird virtual space, right? So that's something that I think might get a little overlooked sometimes in the corporate world is the importance of that, is the, the, the fact that you can create this sense of play that gets employees invested in the experience. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll just bring up a quote from the Harvard Business Review talking about companies like Walmart and Verizon uh, using the metaverse for corporate training. And I love the way they phrase this. They said it, it is immersive enough for people to take the training seriously, but also a safe environment where learners are less self-conscious about speaking frankly compared to talking to real people. So it creates this balance where people are invested in the experience. They're engaged in it. You remove all the distraction of the 32 tabs and three monitors you have in front of your face, pulling you away from whatever learning or communication you're going through, but you're still an avatar, you're still somewhat removed, you're still in your own comfort of your home where you can feel open and honest. And that creates this, this um, inclusivity of ideas where people feel comfortable sharing. And then to Lynn's point, we open up all of these geographic barriers we used to have before where we can start to bring new people in the room. And, and this idea of diversity, I, th I think companies are shifting their perspective where diversity is no longer a cost. It's not something that they're trying to appease to, the, to stay relevant. It's actually an investment. How do we get the most diverse set of ideas in the room so that we can get to the best ideas faster by having that difference of perspective? And by having these virtual communication tools, these collaboration rooms, you're able to open up so many more doors to get to those ideas and, and even new ideas that maybe certain markets have never had access to before. Now, I've got a million other thoughts, but I don't want to hawk the mic. <laughs> and I'm sure you've got other questions, Lauren, so I'll kick it back over. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm just thinking about, you know, the, the, the for me, uh, inclusivity, it's, it's, it's not uh, a word I use for marketing purpose. It's, it's a real long-term philosophy. And my, my main question is how we give a, a equal chance to each one and everyone everywhere. And so uh, my question is uh, which barrier uh, we have to face and to solve in order to really uh, onboard everyone because a VR headset has a cost you know, and how to experiment uh, the metaverse without the proper uh, tools a uh, device. What is your, are your thoughts uh, regarding these guys who want to share? I think yeah. you, that is a yeah. big problem. It's, it's really fundamental. I remember having this article, I'd never set foot in Africa before talking about um, banking the unbanked. And I, I would say, okay, so have you ever been there? Right. Well, if you've ever been there, you would know that the first problem is how to get a mobile phone signal. Go to rural parts of, of as Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Zambia, Botswana, Sierra Leone, Kenya, etc. All the places I've been, you'll find that getting a mobile phone signal is, is your first challenge. And then being able to afford to have a mobile that's not an insignificant cost in countries where the average person's living on two to five dollars a day. You know, the, the, these are these are big, big issues. And when we talk about um inclusivity, we tend to think very much about our own immediacy you know it's it's my constant bugbear is that we're looking for first world solutions to to wider world and indeed third world problems how does a gifted kid who who wants to to be a programmer developer who wants to engage in this world from a rural part of tanzania or kenya or egypt or any of these places you, you don't even have to go to the poorest states in africa you can go to some of the quite affluent states in africa and the cost of a vr headset is a is a month's living these are not insignificant issues, and and I think when we talk in this world, I think we're very quick to talk about how we can democratize this and emancipate that. Yeah, 
we're not looking at the, the first steps. How do we get broadband into people's homes cheaply, effectively, such that everybody can access it? How do we deal with that? You know, in Africa, they have a huge opportunity to, to leap. What we've done in the West, you don't have to do the dial up ISDN, you know, DSL, ADSL, et cetera, pathway. Actually, they're just jumping straight to 5G. And it's it's the right way to go for them. But there are also some fantastic projects I've seen coming out where they're looking at how they can use anything from balloons to a series of, of pylons to, to broadcast along key highways. It, it is coming. But if we really want to talk about the equality of opportunity, there's a lot more that needs to happen to bring the cost of these things right down. And I'd like to broaden the the scope and the gaze, if I may, just a, just a little bit around uh, some of the work that some friends at NASA are doing where they've moved, you know, the educational platforms that you spoke about, Ricky, uh, into the metaverse. And there are uh, digital offices being built for people to congregate across continents. There's a lot of opportunities. I think the barriers for me are limited to our scope of imagination, what we can think about, because uh, my mind goes to the mining and the raw resources required and then the satellites that are creating space debris for future astronomers and future generations um, who will uh, at some point not be able to you know gaze out into the cosmos as we did or as our ancestors did and so I think the line of sight is really important when we look at this question of barriers it's it's a little bit like looking at the you know, at the immediate, at the larger, and then the expansive. And so when we extend that line of sight, there's a couple of different things that I'd like to suggest we consider. One of them is the changing nature of human interaction, where now it's much more immediate. You know, when the internet started a few decades ago, there was a forum, you could post a thread, and then there's this different engagement with space-time where people could take, you know, the, their time to respond. Now it's immediate, and that's changing the way that our brains process social interactions, the way that we connect with each other, and the way that we're able to self-regulate, essentially. And so when you have this emotional contagion um, on a digital platform, and it can spread, for example, Twitter or other platforms that create pockets of epistemic bubbles, my concern is that as a tool that's being offered for connectivity, it may at a certain point create these web bubbles and metaverse bubbles where access to certain rooms, exclusive rooms, having been part of the first ever uh, Meta Biennale for an art show, you know, the level, the velocity and the and the volume of advancement in technology is astronomic. And so having access to that and then keeping, you know, the scores of people who are in line looking to experience that childlike, you know, amazement with uh, a different sense of reality. The final piece I'll add is the distinction that we're going to have to make in the future. And I've presented about this, um, if you're interested in learning more, uh, between illusion and reality. So if we fast forward a little bit further, what will be the social skills? What will be the soft skills? What will be the impact of people who are fully immersed in the metaverse? And we can see use cases in some countries in Asia where they're offering, you know, time off for people to date because <laughs> they're so immersed in the digital world and the world of work. And so they're they're concerned around birth date fecundity. So with that, I'll, uh, there's a lot of other points, but Keen to hear other speakers. Thanks to you. Lina, I used to uh, go uh, several times in Africa as a volunteer, contributing to a non-profit non organization. I was in 2021 in uh, Comor, Iceland, one of the poorest countries in the world. And I, I was uh, in charge of uh, helping the government to implement their 2030 digital transformation strategy financed by uh, FMI, Europe, and so on. And I quickly faced the reality, internet connection. And I met a lot of uh, amazing young people, talented, ready to jump, adopt, learn, and contribute. But when you, f you face a really bad network and our expensive cost to get access to internet, how can we pretend that we want on board each one, everyone, and even more when I think a few years ago, Web2 startup have introduced what we call bring your own device. So 
I recruit people. I don't invest in any device. I tell them to bring their own and I give them a few money monthly and I don't have to manage this. It was, it was nice, but one more time, it works with privileged people. But how can you give the same chance to everyone when you, let's say, misconsider this as aspect? What is the, the, your, your point of view, Lynn? Yeah, so personally, I'm on the ground. You guys visited, but for me, I'm on the ground. So uh, Africa, personally in Kenya, it's a space of an imbalance. It's a very huge disparity between the privileged and the unprivileged. So in my country, like Kenya, we already have 5G, but the 5G is accessible to the ones in the city. But again, you go down to the rural towns and the rural cities, you find no signal of the internet, yet it's the same country, same type of people, but there's a very huge disparity. Also, when it comes to countries, you can go to South Africa, you may go to maybe West Africa and uh, Central Africa, and then you come back to Kenya, you find one country is far developed than the other, and the other one is far left behind. So there are very huge disparities. And uh, for me, I think, uh, Metaverse and the Web3 is what will trigger that uh, awakening. It will trigger that waking up of governments because the issue is not even the people, the issue is not the, the countries, because the resources are here in Africa. We look at the gold, we look at oil, if you look at cobalt, cobalt is one of the materials and the coal tan, one of the major materials for producing electric devices are uh, things like the, the, the PCs, the phones, majority of the resources, the raw materials come from Central Africa. But when you go to Central Africa, you find the people don't even have the, the devices itself. They don't even know why am I mining this code? They don't know the use, but it's used all over globally. So the problem is not the resources and the, the human resources. The problem is me majorly the governments and uh, the policies that were up there, the things that we inherited before we got the past colonial period. Those are the things that have really dragged us behind. But the responsibility goes to us and the people who we elect because they don't look at the, 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 the long term. They're there for, for fun. I'm a leader. I have the power. But right now, we, with the thing with Web3, we have very young people like me who are educating the, the, the rest of the continent. This is what is happening. This is a revolution. This is why you should get on board. This is how we should get into more into the government and tell them this is what we need. And uh, bring partners. I've seen a lot of governments, African governments, partnering with big tech corporations like Microsoft. Actually, Elon Musk's payments is now in Africa and it's in some part of Africa. So these are some of the major moves that are happening. But we as the young people, we still take responsibility to push, to push, to push these things. Because the problem, we've realized the problem is not us. The problem is not the humans and everything. The problem is just very tiny, tiny places where that has to do with policies, the policies and everything. That is where the big issue is. And now when we get people like you who are collaborating with the government, people like me and you who are now teaching what is happening in Africa, here in the world, what is happening, the whole the explosion, that is how we want to achieve equality. And in my thoughts, and let me, this is the last one, in my thoughts, uh, Web3 will never achieve its potential is if continents like Africa don't get involved, because this is where you find user cases. For example, in education system, our education systems are broken. But right now we have the introduction of VR education, we have AR education. This is where you can bring them. There's so, major there's so many schools, majority of people in Africa are young people. We are all young. If you come to Africa, you may think everyone is young because you barely meet an old person. The median age here is 19 years old. And who is this tech for? Majority of the users who would use Metaverse. And all these are Gen Alphas and Gen Zs. And where are they? Majority of them are here in Africa. So if this technology is not to end up like a bubble, you need to find the right user cases for education, for touring. Africa is very rich in tourism. We come here, the, uh, the, the African tourism will fascinate. These are the some of the user cases that if this tech needs to go long term, they can find its user cases, a lot of user cases here. 
the only thing is to just treat that small cup. Yeah, thank you. I'd go a bit further on all of this and I'd say what we need is a complete change of mentality. We need to move away from the corporatist mentality of I win, you lose to a capitalist mentality, which is I win, we win. And it's much more long term. And two points to this. Uh, I was working with a guy called Steve Joubert. He and I were looking at how we could address artisanal mining in sub-Saharan Africa. We focused in Mozambique. And when we took our plans for how we could actually bring the gold miners directly to markets and facilitate that in a transparent, open way, uh, which actually would have greatly increased their income, greatly increased everything from a health and wealth perspective for them and their families. Philanthropic groups told us that what we were doing was too too commercial because we made an 8% net margin. And um, commercial investment groups would look at it and say it was too philanthropic because we spent most of our money on teaching people how to rebuild the land after it had been mined so that it could be returned to farmland, etc. The, the point for me was it was like a ferric victory because we found the exact point between the two states. And here's the thing that people need to understand. A an economy in which we can all participate is, is infinitely bigger than the one that we have today and the one we perceive today. So we need to start thinking about long-term investments. At Davos, I met a very interesting guy who used to sit on the board of the... Um, the San Francisco Fed. And I said that one of the big problems we have in QBQ is that we're literally trying to build the set of economics, the, the base fabric for, for us to, to, to turn and give to the world and say, this is how you can all own the infrastructure. We can all add value to that infrastructure. How do you solve the classic problem of TAM, SAM, SOM, total addressable market, serviceable addressable market, serviceable attainable market for the VCs and funders out there? And he said, you know, the thing of it is what you're trying to do does have numbers. Because I said, how do we quantify the lost economic opportunity from distant franchise? And uh, he said, no, we did actually look at this. They actually did a numbers on this and they found that the African-American community in the United States of America alone lost their lack of economic equality of opportunity cost the U.S. economy 57, 50, yeah, $53 trillion between 1990 and 2020. And between 2020 and 2050, if nothing changed, they were expecting that to go up to $177 trillion of cost to the economy. That is phenomenal. Now, if you think that's just one set of people in one, okay, albeit the biggest economy in the world, what might the world look like when you've got 1.2 billion people in Africa who are now able to actually participate in the, in, in the, in, in the global economy? The same in South America. Uh, and as Len points out, the population of Africa is young. These are people who, if things are done correctly, will be customers for the next 60 years. They'll be users, they'll be providers, they'll be part of the, the ecosystem. And when we talk about the future of work, that capacity for people to lend that creative and intellectual capacity at scale from a global level, that is the sort of transformation that I think really transforms everything. Thank you, Greg. It's someone who wants to interact. There's one thing I can, I can double click on, but I like the, the Greg Mashholmes that I think the biggest thing is like a shift in mindset on this I win, you lose versus let's all make the pie bigger, um, especially in emerging technologies. I think that's a really, really important mindset to have is this concept of partnering and, and coming up with the best ideas together and pushing the industry forward and the total market forward um, versus thinking small minded on just me pursue. And this is actually a bigger shift than just technology and business, right? Like the, think about the way wars used to be fought. Like the way that you grow a society used to be, you have a hundred goats, we have a hundred goats. I'm going to steal your goats and I'm going to kill your people and I'm going to take your land. And now I win and you lose. Well, that's not really how wars are necessarily fought today, right? Like things have changed a little bit. Now, I think the, for at least for, for, for countries that have reached this place of stability, the best way for them to continue growing is actually to invest in developing countries and be able to find the next Einstein, the, the next person to solve and cure cancer is more likely to come from these places that are under resourced without that infrastructure than they are to come from here. And so by shifting the mindset and thinking about these problems and thinking about how do we solve these infrastructure issues, the entire world benefits from that. So I think that's an important mindset to have. But the other thing is just thinking about how important that is from a, a coding perspective. This idea of implicit bias is really real. If, if we're creating this interoperable virtual world that we're all going to be interacting with, 
and it's siloed into like one or two different countries building it, well, then it's not going to really be built for everyone, right? Like we're going to end up with all of these guide rails coded into the bot form, whether people meant to do it or not, because they simply didn't have a perspective. So I think I don't personally have the answers to a lot of these problems, but I see the importance of them. And I think that there are things that need to be solved for, for sure. I've been working on this for the past uh, decade or so. So if it's okay that I jump in, I think, you know, changing mindsets is one of the hardest things that we can do. And it starts with a level of self-awareness. It starts with introspection. It starts with platforms like this, Laurent, that you put together. So I applaud you and your efforts for bringing people together in this way and to hold space for dialogue like this. It's really important and needs to happen. At the same time, I think the, the piece that is top of mind for me is the fact that we're embedded and nested cultures within cultures. Our notion of history in the past, even in terms of how wars were fought, not necessarily if you extend the line of sight back to the Denisovians or, you know, other ancients who had this uh, gamified perspective, collaboration and co-creation. I recently presented on game theory for business intelligence. I'd like to offer that as a piece. And I think part of what we're looking at right now, and I also at a developer conference with Microsoft, when we looked at unconscious bias, there's two points. One of them is, apologies, got the coffee at seven in the morning, so uh, the noise in the background. Um, and, and even coffee, you know, where, where it comes from and, and the raw resources. So I keep coming back to what, uh, Lynn, I think you spoke very eloquently about both the intergenerational aspect and then the you know lithium iron nickel where we go with gamification though i think we need to be really mindful of the single player games that our current generation is engaging with as we move to multiplayer scenarios when we look at our educational system and the future of education how we prime and prune our neural connectivity to think about, okay, what does winning mean? What does winning for everybody mean? That starts at a very young age. When we start separating us and them mentalities, the based on neuroscience as to who's with us and who's out of, of our inner social group, and these are primal evolutionary biological phenomenon, we see that they're formed within the first six months of birth. And those six months are critical. So when we look at the architecture and the neighborhoods and the exposure that children get in those early years, that becomes critical. And so my key focus, I think, in terms of changing that mindset that you spoke so um, importantly pointed out, Greg, is to focus on children on education, but also working with executives, creating that space and that time. So a lot of people going off to retreats, ayahuasca retreats, having these, you know, spiritual uh, epiphanies and revelations about how we're all connected and there's more that we can do. These can be cultivated with the spaces that we create and in the technology that we create, because the other concern that I have when you spoke about barriers, Laurent, is yes, uh, it's important to bring people into the ecosystem. It also needs to be an ecosystem that's rich with nutrients. That soil that we're depleting in our lands is also happening in our tech landscapes. And I think developers are the stewards of these di digital landscapes. So lots more to say, but I'm going to put myself on mute. And uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks. <laughs> thanks to you. We are uh, we we are now uh, close to end this uh, panel discussion. I'm sure we could continue uh, keep going uh, to share our vision. Uh, thanks a lot. A last word. I'll have a quick last word. You know what's uh, sad about these panels? And actually, Laurel, I want to applaud you. You put on uh, a whole conference where nobody got to um, do the WWE thing and choreograph what we were or not going to say, so we could actually have a real conversation as people. I think that's great. But I, I would also say this, I think you need to make these panels longer because, you know, we all had things to, to add to this conversation. Uh, we didn't even get to touch into things like how do we make innovation work in a very structured way? Actually, the best innovation is completely unstructured. And, you know, gaming can play a part in that. So there are so many topics we could have explored further with this. So I would just say to you, make the, make the panels longer. If you get If you get people to actually come on and really talk, uh, that that's courageous step one courageous step two is let us talk a bit longer because i think there could have been a really interesting um, I, I do agree i realize this uh, since the panel one uh, <laughs> to be honest i say it again we learn on the way we improve on the way and uh, i'm sure that the 
the, the next edition in June will be uh, even better. A last word, uh, Lynn? Yeah, so I'm very thankful and I'm looking forward to network with you all. Let's continue with this conversation. As Greg has said, a lot could have been said, but we appreciate the, the, the time that you've given us. And as well as uh, I looked at some research about gamification and my key takeaway about gamification and the whole gamify ecosystem. The research was saying that gamification is 70% psychology and 25% technology. So that was my key takeaway. I really needed to go deeper into that, but I'm grateful. We're going to go with this later on. Thank you so much. Thanks to you. Hey, Keith. I love that. I love that quote that, that you pulled out. You just like dropped some magic on us right at the end there in, in, in your final statement. Uh, no, this is great. Um, I, I really appreciate all of the speakers having such a rich background of experience. Um, the fact that this conversation wasn't just like, hey, what's my favorite metaverse platform? This is why you got to use VR. It like opened up into this really valuable conversation about like culture and people and like, how do we get the most out of this technology? And it, I think it was a lot more valuable than even I thought coming into this, you know, early in the morning here in California. So I just appreciate all the speakers having that depth of knowledge to be able to share. Thanks to, thanks to you. Um, uh, Marianne? I, I echo the sentiment of my uh, peer panelists, and I think I, I would just uh, extend a gratitude for the curation of the people and the perspectives. And I think my final words would be, I think it's really important to embed and intentionally have universal design. It's a concept in design. It's fascinating universal design in the conceptual architecture phase of all technologies. And I feel that's what you're doing here. Laurent, that's why I believe in the work that you're um, so so diligently and hard, you know, behind the scenes working to bring to life. And I just uh, have gratitude as well to my fellow panelists, Greg, Lynn and Ricky, thank you for your wisdom. Thank, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, it's a pleasure and uh, a valuable source of uh, inspiration and motivation to keep uh, building and uh, on onboarding people for this uh, Web3 Stronger Together initiative. See you soon. Take care. And thanks again uh, for uh, your uh, valuable uh, thoughts. Bye bye. Thanks again to our guests and thank you everyone for listening. Thanks also to the Barian Music team for providing their music. You can check them out on barianmusic.com. All of the supporting information is on our website, blockchainrecorded.com. You can listen to us on Google, Apple, and Amazon podcasts, as well as on YouTube, Spotify, Radio Public, and Stitcher. You can follow us on Twitter and YouTube, where we are super grateful for your support. Stay tuned for our next episode.